Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. You know, on this show, occasionally I have an opportunity to interview a legend. And today is just such an opportunity. Time now to turn to Jimmy Song, a Bitcoin educator, developer, and entrepreneur. He's the author of a new book available for pre-order on Amazon called Programming Bitcoin, Learn How to Program Bitcoin from Scratch. Jimmy Song, welcome for the first time to Kaiser Report. Well, thank you for having me, Bitcoin mom and dad. Uh, it is a pleasure to be on this show. You know, I am a big fan of yours, and uh, and you know, I can't believe it took us this long to you know actually be on the or took me this long to be on the show. Well, it's uh, great to have you on, and you've got this book coming out. We're going to be talking about that in a second. But before we get into your book, uh, Jimmy, you are a Bitcoin developer or Bitcoin core, as some now say. Tell us, Jimmy, what does that actually mean? You know, to the person who might not be aware of what's going on here, what does it mean to be a Bitcoin core developer, Jimmy Song? Well, Bitcoin Core is the software that Satoshi originally wrote, and it is, uh, for that reason, called the reference client. And anyone that contributes to the Bitcoin Core software is, uh, is a Bitcoin Core developer. So I have about 15 commits to my name uh, into the Bitcoin Core repository, so that's what it means. And that means working on the software, making sure that it runs well, that it doesn't use too many resources, that it's efficient, that it doesn't have bugs, things like that. All right, cool. Um, now, people are aware with this concept of HODL, uh, and that's mm -hmm. relatively easy. You buy some Bitcoin and you HODL or hold it, and according to people like Chase Mayer, that's the first and primary network effect that creates to the robustness and the scalability and the adoption of Bitcoin. Now, also, there is the you know, building on Bitcoin. What are some of the cool things being built on Bitcoin right now, and what will that do for the ecosystem, Jimmy? Well, so we currently are on SegWit version zero. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that SegWit allows for a, an, a very easy upgrade path for um, subsequent upgrades. So they can be put in as software. So among other things, SegWit version one is going to have Schnorr signatures, uh, taproot, graph root, uh, sig hash, no input, really op, op mass. But these are all improvements uh, to make Lightning a lot easier to code for developers. Uh, they, they're going. Uh, we're looking at Neutrino as a as something that's going to go in that'll give you more privacy from a Light Wallet perspective. You don't have to run a full node to get uh, the uh, you know good pri privacy properties that you would get. Um, uh, you know, like off of a full node, you 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 only have to run a light node to do that. So a lot of really cool things coming down. Most of it having to do with privacy and um, you know, like coin joins and things like that. So it, it's it's a very good development. Something that Bitcoin really needs. Right. Let's talk about Lightning Networks for a second. You know, I was mm -hmm. at uh, Crypto Springs last year in uh, Palm Springs with Elizabeth Stark, uh, Stacy Herbert. And um, uh, Demirs, Demirs, um, and uh, Meltem, Demirs, and uh, you know this is the big talk of the town was Lightning Networks and Lightning Le Networks Labs. This does something uh, very important. Is that you know explain to the folks how this creates an environment for transactions that are uh, I think an improvement, if you will, or talk talk about Lightning Networks because this is the level two scaling that everyone's been waiting for. What does it do? When you do on-chain transactions, it takes anywhere from five to 30 minutes for it to confirm. And that can be very annoying for any sort of instant transaction that you want to make. What Lightning allows is for you to do those transactions pretty much instantly, um, you know, at the speed of a web page uh, load or something like that, very, very quickly and trustlessly. And that's a really big win. Uh, furthermore, uh, with a an on-chain transaction, everyone has to know about it. So the transaction has to propagate to pretty much every node on the network. But with Lightning, you only have to send to the people that need to know about it, whether they're routing nodes or the counterparty that you're trading with. So that that preserves privacy, it reduces bandwidth, it makes it more trustless, and it um, doesn't require as much data on the blockchain. So it, it's a win all around, pretty much. Yeah, let's go back to uh, really, you know, last year, a year before that, the build up towards SegWit. You know, an interesting split in the community developed. Those that were really more corporate focused, uh, the New York Agreement, as it was called, and the big corporate players in the space kind of took sides against 
um, what we might call uh, maximalists or folks that were looking uh, at Bitcoin more as a purist um, uh, point of view. And the, the, the purist won out. Uh, SegWit was adopted. Now it's um, growing quite rapidly. And, and is this to be, it was an existential crisis. You know, I've talked to people like the Vortex and others who were, and yourself and Jim and uh, Tone Vase, they were really on the forefront of battling uh, for the, the purity of, of Bitcoin. And, and you guys won that, that battle. But um, do you see that type of existential crisis continuing or is that kind of the last of the big battles uh, opening the path for Bitcoin uh, because you st all the forks that resulted as a, as a result of that have all kind of disappeared or become uh, non-entities. And it's really, the, the protocol, I mean, the question is this, Jimmy, the protocol in its genius seems to, like have an immune system that rejects charlatans and rejects mm -hmm. everything that is against what it was meant to do. Is, is that a fair statement? And, can, and do you think that'll continue going forward? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a fair statement. It, I, I mean, uh, what we had during Segwit2x was a governance takeover attack. We we had a bunch of players uh, that wanted to control Bitcoin in some way. Uh, they they were saying stuff like, "We're we're the businesses and." We do 80% of the transactions on the network. We have like 90% of the mining hash power on the network. Therefore, we have a right to control this thing. And that's very much against the spirit of Bitcoin. And the users uh, amazingly actually rose up and said, we're not going to take that. You don't control things. And that's that's a very different thing than what we see in government and business in any sort of other governance model today, which is that if you have government and big business get together, they usually get what they want. And Bitcoin was very unique in that way. Um, now, are they going to try again? Possibly. Um, Bitcoin is too valuable and too interesting uh, to not have some sort of attack uh, come against it in the future. But there is, like you said, an immune system that's already there. And there's a lot of white blood cells, um, you know, like people that are doing user activated softworks and things like that, that, that try to uh, sort of exert the power that the users have. And that, that's a very good thing. And I, I expect, um, you know, more attacks. But as we thwart those attacks, that's generally when we've seen giant price rises is, when Bitcoin proves itself to be anti-fragile. Right, that's right. We saw what the, after Segwit uh, battle was won, that was when the first burst over, over 10,000. And you know, when, I, when you're talking about governance and you're talking about the users winning out over the, the monoliths, the corporations, the plutocrats, I think, you know, in terms of what we're seeing around the world with the Yellow Vest movement or the Gilets Jaunes, as it's called in France, and other of these protest movements, it seems as though Bitcoin is the currency of resistance. Bitcoin should be the currency for all of these global movements to unify because for exactly what you're saying there, the governance model is a, one of superior to any other governance model. So we haven't done a very good job of uh, marketing Bitcoin very well, and that's for a good reason. We're, we're not really marketers, we're, we're really mostly coders. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the, the biggest thing that Bitcoin brings is decentralizing monetary power, financial power. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't re recognize is that monetary power is the big force in the world, right? Like it, it's the people, the people that co control the purse strings really run the world. And, uh, and all of these protest movements and things like that, they are going after changing who's in charge. Really what they should be doing is taking power back for themselves, decentralizing power. And it starts with Bitcoin. And if they re realize that, then that's, that's the first thing that they would do and take the power away very quickly, uh, I mean, slowly and quickly in, in, in different ways. Um, and and change things for the better going forward instead of uh, sort of putting their lives on the line and, you know, uh, risking jail turns and things like that. Uh, I, I think this is a much more peaceful revolution that's possible with Bitcoin. Right. I think one of the other problems, I'll just quickly touch on this, is that the Bitcoin has the ability to actually, not only does it have an immune system that keeps out the bad actors and the charlatans, but it does have the ability to drive some people insane. Um, I'm, look, I'm thinking about a Matthew Mellon or a Roger Ver or a Jihan Wu. Uh, people have died or they've gone insane because of this kind of godlike pure technology that's given, that gives us so much. 
And I'm going to be talking about this, by the way, at uh, Unconfiscatable in Vegas, uh, January 24th. You'll be there at the Unconfiscatable conference, as long with Tone Vays and others, and I'm looking forward to that. But talk about price for a second, Jimmy. So in other words, price going up gets people's attention. It drives some people insane. Uh, but as a developer, if the price were, were not going up, would you still be interested in developing it? If the price dropped to 500 or 400 or 300 or 50 bucks, would, would there still be a development circle, uh, a crowd going after it, Jimmy? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think uh, it's a cypherpunk ideal. So it's not really necessarily about like what the price is at the moment. We, uh, the, the people that are working on it, believe in it long term. We have a long time preference, right? Like we're, 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 or, um, or a low time preference, not a long time preference. We, we're in it for the long haul. And in fact, actually, the price going up can be actually a very big distraction for a lot of developers. You know, developers are human too. And like, uh, you know, when, when the price is going up, we're all thinking about how much Bitcoin we have and what we can buy and things like that. So it's very easy to get distracted when, when there's a bull market. Whereas during a bear market, it's like you don't want to think about that much, uh, the, the price that much. And instead you get down to work and build all sorts of goods and services that might be useful to people. And that's a very good thing. So uh, for me, at least, and for a lot of developers I know, that that that's the direction that we all tend towards. All right, uh, great. Let's talk about your book now. It's called Programming Bitcoin, Learn How to Program Bitcoin from Scratch. It's available on pre-order right now. Uh, tell us about it. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it came out of my seminars. Uh, I do these two-day seminars, and basically it's, uh, it's a seminar in book form. But basically it takes you from everything that you need to know to learn Bitcoin, from the actual math. The first three chapters are actually like very math-heavy, um, all the way to, you know, like networking protocol and stuff like that and uh, sending transactions and blocks and stuff uh, back and forth. You learn everything that you need to know to at least uh, know the blockchain. Um, I'm working on a second course that will probably be a second book eventually, but that's uh, that's based on programming a wallet. Um, but that's that's what the book is about. It's it's for you to learn. If you're a developer that knows Python, it's a great book to pick up and uh, to learn Bitcoin. Okay, right. So once again, you will be at Con Unconfiscatable in Vegas, January 24th. Jimmy Song, thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you for having me. All righty. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Jimmy Song. If you want to catch us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.